Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. Hmm. Well, the Lord chastised me on something and it's okay to be chastised by the Lord. And about the time the Lord starts chastising me, he reminds me of a scripture where he said, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So he must really love me <laughs> because I really feel like I got some discipline. And uh, this last Thursday night, which by the way, uh, this last Thursday night, if you were not here and did not hear that message by Justin Goff, you need to look it up on YouTube, on our church YouTube channel, and listen to it. Watch it. It was amazing. It, it was life-changing. But Thursday after church, one of our church members, who has been going through chemo, uh, came up to me and said, when you went through chemo, referring to me, and you were told you had stage four, which now I have stage zero, by the way. He said, what did you do? And I don't know. Maybe I was a little distracted. I mean, he's a good friend. I love him. He's a member of the church. He and his wife have been going here for many, many years. But I started telling him what I did in the natural. I said, well, you know, I cut down on sugar. I, and, and I started taking vitamin supplements more. And... and you know, I started going through that routine when he said, what do you do? And when I got home that night, of course, when I got home that night, I found Loretta in a pool of blood, and that was not one of my most fun moments. Uh, but after we got her in the hospital and everything got settled down, and at 5 a.m. that morning I went home, I heard the Lord speak to me and tell me that what I told this friend was wrong because I started telling him all the things in the natural to do when in reality it's it's kind of like first words when a crisis happens the first words are so important you know if if you're if your car is going over the cliff the last thing you want to say is, oh my God, I'm going to die. You, you need to say something more like what the singing deacons songs, help me, Lord. Now, you can't necessarily change the circumstances, but you can change things in the spirit that affect the circumstances. And the way you do that is through your words. And my words to this young friend, my words were incorrect. Because what I should have said is when your back's against the wall, when they tell you, which they had told him, that you have stage four or whatever, what you say is vitally important. And what you say is what God says about you. Don't get that confused with denial. There's a huge difference between speaking God's word and his promise and denial. You know, as I've told you many, many times, faith is saying what God says. And denial, well, that's a river in Egypt. <laughs> denial is when you take the positive, and turn it around to the negative. Now, let, let me give you an example. To say, I do not have cancer, when you've been diagnosed with cancer, is not a faith confession. It's a denial. You're not saying what God promised. You're, you're 
claiming that you don't have what you do have. To say, I'm not sick, is, is not a, a faith confession. To say, I'm not sick, is denying what you're going through. It's the opposite of faith. The Word of God tells us that faith confession is calling those things that be not as though they are. Denial is calling those things that are as though they are not. Now you're going to have to think about that for a moment, but there is a difference. Calling those things that be not as though they are is different than calling those things that are as though they are not. By faith I have been healed, is what God says. They say I have this. The situation looks like I have this. Well, how do things look? See, and sometimes people think, well, if I'm in faith, I can't tell people what's, what's going on. How, how can I tell somebody that I went to the doctor and the doctor said that I've got whatever. I've got stage four something. Anything. Pick any illness. The doctor says, you have stage four whatever. And I'm thinking that you probably have about six months. You need to get your affairs in order. Now, some people would say, when someone says, what did the doctor say? Oh, he said everything was fine. I'm healed. Liar, liar, pants on fire. That's not what the doctor said. What did the doctor say? It's okay for you to say, the doctor said, but the word says, so are you following me? So, the doctor said this. But God's word says in 1 Peter 2.24, by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. So if I have been healed, I am healed. Somebody says, well, it doesn't look like it. Well, here's the thing. I believe what God says over what I see and the Word of God says we walk by faith and not by sight. What does that mean? I believe what God says more than I believe what I see. Because what you see is physical, what God says is spiritual, and the spiritual always overrides the physical. In situations like what I'm in right now, where my mother and my wife are both in different hospitals, I've in years past, I've heard people say, well, don't tell anybody. Well, how are you going to get the prayer of agreement unless somebody knows what they're agreeing for? And see, it sounds like a paradox to the world. You know, there's a place, uh, and I believe it's Mark eleven twenty four, where it says that if we believe that we have received, we will receive. Now that's, that doesn't make any sense. You believe that you have received, and if you believe you have received, then you will receive. What does that mean? That means when you're believing it, you don't have it yet, technically, in the physical. But if you believe that God has done His work, then you will see God doing His work. And that is why the only fight that a Christian is told to fight in the Bible is the fight of faith. Because it is so difficult for the natural man you know, the Bible says a natural man doesn't understand spiritual things. It's so difficult for the natural man to believe that God has done what he said he would do when it doesn't look like it. <clears throat> and somebody will say, well, but it looks like this. My answer is quit looking. You cannot deny 
And there are Christians who deny and die. They say, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, until they can't say it anymore. But do not, don't deny walk in faith. And your tongue and the words you say are extremely critical. Let's take a look at some scriptures. Proverbs 12, 6. The words of the wicked one lie in wait for blood. But the mouth of the upright, the mouth of the upright will deliver them. The mouth of the upright. Are you upright? Well, your mouth can deliver you. See, people think that words just don't mean anything. I've heard people say words mean nothing. No, no. Words in God's kingdom, words mean a lot. You live and die by your words. Proverbs 14.3 says, In the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. Okay. If you're a born-again believer, you have the ability to walk in the wisdom of God. You have been given His Word. And His Word can deliver. But it can deliver when His Word comes from your mouth. You are a speaking spirit. In Genesis, in the original Hebrew, it tells us that God created us in His image in that we are speaking spirits, like He is a speaking spirit. And you'll find that the way God works is He stepped into darkness. It was dark. He didn't say what He saw. You've heard me say this many times. He didn't say what He saw. He didn't step into darkness and say, Whoa! It's dark. He didn't say what He saw. He spoke what He wanted. And He said, Light be! Keep in mind, when he said that, he was in darkness. But he stepped into darkness and said, Light be. And then once he said it, it was. And we are created in his likeness and image. And all through the word of God, we are told that we can speak things into existence. We can prevent catastrophes. We can control the demonic spirits because we have been given authority over all the power of the enemy, and you take that authority with your words. Jesus, once again, Jesus spoke to the storm. He didn't pray silently to the storm or about the storm in the back of the boat. He didn't do that. He faced the storm and he said, Be still. In the original Greek, that word, be still, can be translated, hush, or shut up. <laughs> he shut the storm down because he spoke to it. Now, now think about this. And I say this respectfully, and don't get weird on me on this. But Jesus didn't pray to the storm or pray about the storm. He didn't talk to God about the storm. He didn't call, call his father up in prayer and say, Heavenly Father, I need to talk to you for just a little bit. There's this storm out there. And it's really huffing and a puffing and it's about to blow this ship down. And would you take care of it? Father, would you take care of the storm? No, he didn't do that. What did he do? He spoke to the storm. Ephesians 5 1 says we're to be imitators of God. We're to imitate Him. What's that mean? We're to do what He does. Sometimes you need to speak to the trial or the tribulation or the thing that's coming against you. And tell it to hush, shut up, back off. I have authority over you. It says His name is above every name. Oh, well, what? 
what kind of a name? Tuberculosis? Cancer? Tumors? Anything that has a name. Have you ever noticed? Every time there's a storm comes up, they've got to give it a name. Well, what do you have authority over? Every name that is named. <sighs> what are you putting in your mouth? The Word of God? Or your foot? <laughs> All right, Proverbs 18.20. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Look at verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I like to think of it this way. Your life and your death are in the power of your tongue. Or my life and my death are in the power of my tongue. What I say can bring life, and what I say can bring death. And I've heard people say, well, I'm, I'm sure that that works sometimes. No, it works all the time. This is a spiritual principle, and I just gave you the Word of God. They didn't just need another paragraph and add this. God didn't say, well, you know, we need some more words in the Bible. It's just it's not thick enough yet. Let's... Just add something in there about people talking. No, he didn't do that. Proverbs 18.4 The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. Your mouth matters. When you talk to someone, don't do like I did the other day and just start giving them mumbo-jumbo, don't eat sugar, whatever. I mean, that's okay. If, if they ask you... Did you change your diet? Did you? This? It's okay to talk about that stuff, but the first thing that should have come out of my mouth is you say what God says. You, you start meditating on 1 Peter 2.24, by the stripes of Jesus you have been healed. You start meditating on Psalm 103, I am the Lord thy God who heals you. You begin saying, God wants me well, and I can prove it in his word by what he said and I believe what he said now that doesn't mean you ignore doctors somebody may say well if you really believe that why do you have two of your family members in the hospital we are living right now in a in a place called earth that has been cursed because of the sin of Adam and it has not been redeemed yet. And even though we have authority over the power of the enemy, we have authority over the power of the enemy, the enemy still has power, and he seeks to kill, steal, and destroy, destroy as it says in John 10.10. 10. But the one he wants to steal from is you. The one he wants to kill is you. And the, the person's life he wants to destroy, it's yours. And he uses every opportunity he can to do that. And some of you are doing such a good job of destroying your own life that the devil just sits back and says, I don't want to mess it up. And I'm telling you right now, you, you have a physical body that is on this earth, and if, you're, if your diet is nothing but ho-hos and Diet Coke and Twinkies, you're going to get sick. It's just, it's the way your physical body was made. God didn't make your body to eat chemicals. He didn't, he didn't make you to eat chemicals. You say, well, I didn't know. Well, study up. There's, there's nothing wrong with being a healthy person in your diet. When I find out that something is not good for me, I try to cut it out, cut down or cut out. Just You, you know what I'm saying. 
we, we all know that certain things are not good for you. You know, the, the first thing that they asked Loretta when she went to the hospital, I was with my mom when they checked her in, and the first thing they asked me when I was up at Ellis Michelle, all of them asked the same question right off the bat within the first paragraph of what they were talking about. They said, do you smoke? And do you drink? That's what they said. Do you smoke? And do you drink? And I said, no, I don't smoke. They said, well, when did you quit? I said, 74 years ago. You know, one of the doctors looked at me and he said, that's going to help you out more than you ever realize. He says, because if you smoke and drink, there's not much we can do. That's what he said. He didn't, he didn't say that to me as a pastor. He didn't say that to me as some theologian himself. He just said, if you don't smoke, if you've never smoked and you've never drank, he said, you have no idea what a difference that's going to make in your treatment. He said, because if you do, there's really not a whole lot we can do. Well, if you do, there's a whole lot you can do. Quit! You know, years ago, there was this lady that lived... Uh, when we had our house on the lake, on the other side of the, of the lake, there was this lady, and I was going to buy some land from her. And we had 1,000 feet of shoreline and 22 acres, but there was this little piece of property next to us that I kind of wanted so I could make a beach area for the kids in the back of the cove. And so I went over to her house to see if she would sell this land. And she was in a wheelchair on oxygen and could barely breathe. And when she would talk, to me, it was kind, kind of like this, and which I ended up buying the land from her, by the way. But because uh, if I don't tell you that, someone's going to email me and say, "Did you buy the land?" You know, because so, <laughs> you wouldn't believe. If I don't finish a story, my email box gets filled up. <laughs> I got to tell you. So, but then she took the oxygen little tube and she put it up on her forehead so she could smoke. And I said, I remember saying, is there oxygen in that tank? You know? She goes, yeah. I said, Loretta, we need to go before this house blows up. But, you know, I mean, taking oxygen so she can breathe and then smoking a cigarette to keep her from breathing. I don't know. It's, you know, sometimes you, if you turn the corner, you know, I heard somebody say one time, well, what if I quit now? I've still damaged my lungs. I tell you what. The scripture tells us, and it works in the physical and the spiritual, of course, if you repent and turn the corner, things can change overnight. You know, we, we have had some supernatural miracles in our life. And when when do they happen? Whenever God wants them to happen, you know. You know, and, and see, I don't think I'm any less spiritual because I have two family members in the hospital. Some people would go, oh, well, how can that man teach on healing? Because healing's what God says, and I don't go by what I see, and everything's going to be fine. You know, everything is fine. You know, they're in the hospital. I'm not denying that. But uh, Loretta had a cyst the size of a grapefruit, and our children were, were small. You know, they were like 8 and 10 years old. And Loretta was going to go in the next day because she had just been to the hospital the day before, and they said, we, we need to take this cyst out. And, and I said, well, how large is it? He, the doctor said, it's about the size of a grapefruit. Well, I'm, I'm a guy. I don't eat grapefruit, you know. So, but I was at the grocery store, and I said, where's your grapefruit? And they showed me over. Whoa! <laughs> you know, I didn't gra no grapefruits were so big. So she was going to go into Bothwell, I believe is the name of the hospital, up in Sedalia, and they were going to remove it the next morning. So that night before uh, we went to bed, uh, I told the kids that the next morning I was taking her to the hospital and we'd get them on the bus and all that kind of stuff. And the kids just look at me and 
at the time I wasn't pastor of a church or anything, and I was just traveling around speaking, and, and uh, the kid says, well, Dad, don't you believe in healing? I said, well, yeah, I do. And uh, they said, well, let's just lay hands on Mom, and then, you know, she'll be healed. Well, look, you know how it is. I've been praying for her. I've been praying for her for two or three weeks. We go to the doctor, and the cyst is still there. And I said, well, you know, we just need to get rid of it, you know. And, and so I know that we're going in the next day for to get rid of it, and everything's going to be fine. They said there's no cancer, and everything's going to be fine. And so to humor the kids, I said, okay. So the kids go and get a chair out of the kitchen. They bring it and set it in the living room and tell Loretta to sit on the chair. And the kids lay hands on her. Well, I, I lay hands on them just kind of like, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm just trying to be honest. It was kind of, uh, I'm just doing this for the kids, you know. And boy, the kids prayed. You know, in the name of Jesus, I curse that growth, and I, I tell that growth, be gone, be gone. Okay, they prayed. So I get up the next morning, take her to the hospital. Well, I'm out at, now this is back when I used to drink Coca-Cola. I haven't had but uh, but back then I always had to have a Coke, you know. So we were in the hospital, and and I went out to get a Coke at the at the Coke machine, and and I was getting it out of the Coke machine when the doctor walks out of the room, and he walks out, and he's he looked like he worked at the butcher shop, you know. He he, he had this white on with blood on him, you know. And he comes out and he says. Mr. Allison? I said, yes. He said, I want to talk to you about your wife. I looked, took one look at him, and I thought, oh, no. It, ex it exploded. <laughs> you know, or something. Because <laughs> he, he just, he didn't look like he should be out there talking to me. He said, well, I want to tell you something. This isn't going to save you any money. You're still going to have to pay for the operation. But when we got in there, that cyst was gone. We couldn't find it. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, if I would have just listened to my kids and the Word of God, I could have, surgery back then was a lot cheaper, Doc. <laughs> I could have just saved myself a couple thousand dollars. That's all it was. You see, the faith of a child. See, and sometimes, you know, I've, I've often thought back at that, and I thought, well, why is it that supposedly it didn't work for me? but it worked for the kids. What? The Lord just keeps telling me the faith of a child. See, I grew up in a, in a church that believed that healing didn't exist. That faith healers were just goofy guys out there trying to make some money. Snake oil salesmen, that type of thing. I grew up with that, and that, that can get in you. Now, I'd, been, I'd gotten it out of me, I thought. But those kids didn't have anything to unlearn. All they had was what I had taught them and what they'd heard in church. They didn't have all this unbelief to get rid of. Maybe that was it, maybe not. I don't know. But what I do know is when the doctor got in there, it was gone. The grapefruit had disappeared. So let me give you some scriptures, and then I'm going to let you go home. How's that? All right. Uh, Proverbs 18.7. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a talebearer are like tasty... <laughs> oh, tasty, fill in there what you like. Okay. Tasty ice cream. And they go down into the innermost body. Don't be a tail bearer. Because what you're doing is you are a carrier of death when you are. Proverbs 18.13 He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Wow. What is the produce of his lips? It's his words. What's the produce of your lips? It's your words. 
You know, Charles Capps, when he was here a few years ago, he said, he said, our words are like containers. When, when we, it's almost like in the spirit realm, there's containers that go out of our mouth. And these containers either c contain faith or unbelief. And what do your words contain? All right. Jeremiah 1.12, Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. See, he performs his word. But you are a speaking spirit, and you can speak his word. When you say what God says, the reason they sang that song this morning, I came down here and I told the worship team, I want you to sing that song. Say what God says. Because that's what I want in the minds of the people. We need to understand this. We've got to say what God says. Don't say what the enemy says. Don't, don't repeat what somebody else says unless you're just saying that's what they say. When somebody asks me what the condition is of my mother, I can say, well, the doctor says this. But here's what I believe. Hmm. Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? You can, you can destroy things that the enemy has put in your path by using his word. Hmm. And what's your idle words? Well, I'm afraid so. Your what? What are you saying? Well, Oh, excuse me, that's not what I meant. Well, an idle word is something you just say that you really don't really think about what you're saying. You're not thinking about it. You don't necessarily mean it. You know, I tell you what, this weather's just killing me. I'm dying to get out of here. <laughs> How sure are you on that? I'm dead sure. What do you think of that guy? Well, he's just an accident waiting to happen. I tell you what, I've heard people say this, my life is a mess. My life is just messed up. Some people have planted so many bad seeds that we need to pray for crop failure. <laughs> crop failure comes through repentance. You can't pray for crop, crop failure and then continually say what you've been saying. You know, I'm, I'm glad that my dad, that he must have prayed for crop failure, at least I hope he did, because he used to say, don't you get smart. <laughs> that must be what Forrest Gump's dad said to him all the time. Don't you get smart. Oh. You know, for many people, sickness disease, unrest, poverty. You know what the source of it is? It's your mouth. You know, I knew a guy, true story, I knew a guy probably 40 years ago, and he said to me very clearly, he said, my family has never had anything, and they're trying to get me through college, but I'll tell you something, I've never had anything, and I'm never going to have anything. It's just a, it's like a curse on our family. He said, it's like the Kennedy family curse. It's just a curse on our family. But you know what? That guy went to college. He got a degree. And I talked with him just a few weeks ago. And he'd never had anything. He's living in poverty. And somebody would say, with all the education he had, and he's a smart guy, why didn't he succeed? Because he cursed himself. And he believed what he said. And he believed he would never, he said, I'll never have any more than my dad. My dad never had anything. I'll never have anything. And, you know, you almost feel like saying, yeah, you never will. And because, and if they go, wait, why did you say that? I said, I'm just repeating what you said. See, sometimes people don't realize what they're saying. They say stuff. But Jesus addressed this. Look, in Matthew 12, 36, Jesus said this. But I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak, they will give account of it 
in the day of judgment. Now look what he says about idle words. In the very next breath that Jesus said, he said, for, and that word for in the Greek can also be translated in this place, because, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Many people are condemning themselves without realizing it because things that they are saying that are idle words, they don't even realize they're saying it. How, how many people have prophesied over their children, ah, you're just never going to amount to anything? Or they've said without their kids around, my kid's a doofus. I mean, they just don't know nothing. They, they're just an idiot. They'll always be an idiot. I, I don't know. I can't get that kid straightened out. That kid will not listen to me. Or you know what? And he never will. Why? Because you're prophesying that that kid will never listen to you. What, you, what do I say? Here's what you say. I'm righteous by the blood of Jesus. I'm born again. I was made righteous. And the Scripture says the children of the righteous will be delivered. That's what I'm believing. A few verses later it says the children of the righteous will be blessed. Okay, I'm not righteous because of what I've done. I'm righteous because of what he has done. But nevertheless, I am righteous. And because I am righteous, my child will be delivered. My child will be blessed. That's what I'm saying. You've got to say what God says about your kids. Stop the death talk. <laughs> the seed of your words. James chapter 3, verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. See, your tongue, that's almost like a, a double meaning here, your tongue can control your eating habits. I've heard people say both ways. I just can't lose weight. I don't know what it is. I can go on this diet. I can go on that diet. I can eat this. I can, and I, I just can't lose weight. What's happening? In the realm of the Spirit, there's two forces out there. There's the, the angels of God and the angels of the enemy. And the Scripture tells us in Psalm 103.20 that the angels of God are waiting to hear the voice of His Word so that they can act on it. In Hebrews, it tells us that the angels, the purpose of the angels, the angels have basically two purposes. One is to worship God, and the second one is to minister for those who will inherit salvation. That's what angels, they are ministering spirits. They minister for us. They help us do what we can't do. And when you say something negative, the angels of God, and I just say this metaphorically, they're just sitting back going, Oh, I wish he would speak something we could do. Because when you speak against God's word or you don't say God's word, they have nothing to work on. But when you say God's word, they heed the voice of his word. That means they hear it and they act on it. They act on it what? In your behalf. And things happen behind the scenes you don't even know about. Angels at work. Oh, Pastor, you believe in angels? Of course I do. I believe what God's Word says. In the near future, I've been working on this one message for a long time, but I'm gonna, I want to talk to you about Genesis 6 and how that applies to the lat latter days about how angels came down 200 angels came down and mated with earth women and their children were giants. The Bible talks about it in so many places, but preachers ignore it in every place they can because it's not something you want to talk about. I want to talk to you about it. But do I believe in this stuff? If it's in the Bible, I believe it. Okay? And there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that talk about what angels do for us. But we hinder what they do for us by not being the voice of His Word. When you say what God says, the angels do what God says in your life. When you say the children of the righteous will be delivered and my child will be delivered because I'm righteous, then the angels of God get up and they start working behind the scenes to make that happen. Who knows what's going to happen 
They, they, I mean, they can, they can push buttons you can't push. Matthew 18, 18. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In the translation, it could go this way, and this is a correct translation. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in the realm of the Spirit, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in the realm of the Spirit. You do that with your words, with your confession. Job 22, 28. You also declare a thing, and it will be established for you. Huh? You declare something, and it will be established. Is that good? Well, it depends on what you're declaring. James 3, 6, New Testament. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind but no man can tame the tongue it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison with it we bless our God and Father and with it we curse men we see that all the time we come to church hallelujah Lord somebody cuts us off in traffic and you flip them the bird and say something you shouldn't say. I know that the younger people don't know what that means, but just, just ask some old hippie and they'll tell you, all right? With it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. Does a, a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? In other words, Clean up your mouth. Don't let perverse speech come out of your mouth. Just And you think it's okay because you say good speech sometime. It's not good to curse, and it's not good to cuss. It's just not good. Thank you for... <laughs> James 3.12, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Matthew 12.34, brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now, here's the thing. You've got to get good speech in your heart. And you do that by hearing God's word, taking in God's Word. You want to find out what somebody's got in their heart. And this is a good test. You just bring them up. Like, see, I could bring ZZ up here. Stand up, ZZ, and wave at everybody. Come on. This is easy. Well, I'll praise the Lord. When, when I pulled in the garage this morning, I heard her down in, in the conference room. She's all by herself. Praying? Oh, man. Was, was that girl praying? But I'll tell you what. And... and I'm going to use you as an illustration. I could bring ZZ up here and just, without telling her, just slap her upside the head. Just smack her good. And we'd find out real quick what's in her heart. <laughs> because she's going to talk without thinking. You know what I'm saying? And you slap somebody and they go, what, what did I do? Or you slap and they go, oh, blankety, blank, 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 you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in your heart? Line up up here and we'll find out. You know, we, we should do that. Just line every church member up up here and bring them up. <laughs> slap them upside the head. Find out what's in their heart. <laughs> All right. Psalm 141.3, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And we need, to, we need to pray that. Say, Father, help me, guide me, show me what I should say. 
You know, sometimes the best thing that you can say is nothing. I've been around people sometimes to try to witness to somebody so much, and they're talking so much, I don't, I'm saved and I'm a minister, and I don't even know what they're talking about. Sometimes you just need to say something simple and let it rest. Hmm. <laughs> Psalm 91.1 He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I rest. I will say, not just think it, say it. Proverbs 12, 14, a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth and the recompense of a man's hands. Okay, did you catch it? You're going to be satisfied by what? You want satisfaction? Clean up your mouth. A lot of people are living in a lot of stress because of what they've said. Hmm. You got to learn to recognize death words. Oh, yeah. You know, it just seems like we never have enough. Come on. I heard somebody say a few weeks ago, we'll never get this church paid off. Well, when they said that, we owed a million and a half. Now we owe less than a million. So all I've got to say to that is, nah, 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 okay. <laughs> See, sometimes you dig a ditch with your words, and you'll eventually fall into it. I made that up. That was a good, that was, that was a Larry phrase. Okay. I was thinking about putting it on a bumper sticker, but too many words. And once again, cars don't have bumpers anymore. I've got to keep reminding myself of that. You know, we, we need to be building a safe place with our words. And we need to ask ourselves sometimes, what are we building? That's, that's something just, you know, it's not, what's my spouse building? No, no, what are you building? What are you saying? What do you say when nobody's around? You know, some people talk to themselves. I mean, I know some people that talk to themselves so much, I get lost in the conversation. I don't know if they're talking to me or them, you know. But Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts and I think that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Ah, Joshua 1, 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your what? Oh, boy, that's good. 1 Peter 3.10 For he hmm, For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. You see that? And from speaking deceit. What is deceit? Well, the seats when somebody comes up to you and they're wanting to change your attitude about somebody else. They're, they're concerned that you're going to start liking this person that they don't like. They don't want you to like them because you don't like them. And so you start out by saying, now look, look, just between you and me. It's just between us. And I know I probably shouldn't say this. That's where I usually stop them. It makes them so mad. I say, well, if you shouldn't say it, don't say it. Well, but I just want to tell you, no, look, you said you don't think you should say this, so don't say it. But you need to know how to pray. They always come back with that. You need to know how to pray. And you're not going to know how to pray till I tell you how bad this person is. Don't listen to gossip. You know, if you stop someone from gossiping, you may think they're going to get mad at you, but in reality... It may bring some reality to them. It, it may be like, oh my goodness, I didn't realize what I was doing. It's okay. Now, <laughs> okay. Daniel 10, 12. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, 
your words were heard. And I have come, this is an angel talking, and I have come because of your words. Angels move because of your words. Now, look what it says. Don't fear. You set your heart to understand. You humbled yourself before Lord, before the Lord. And that's good. But he came because of the words. That's what he said. He didn't come because he humbled himself. He didn't come because he had a heart of understanding. He came because of the words. What are you putting out? You know, the reason that the children of Israel stayed 40 years in the wilderness, you know why? The scripture says that their words, they were in their own little tents. They thought it was safe. Sometimes you think your car is your tent. You know, you can't say it inside the church building, but as soon as you get your car, whew, I'm glad we're out here. There's just something i got to tell you. Ah, whoa, time out. The Scripture says that the words went up from their tent to the throne of God, and God heard their words. And because of their words, you, you research it out, they didn't go into the promised land for 40 years. Don't lock yourself out from going into the promised land God has for you because of your words. Don't do it. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Romans 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. Where? In your mouth and in your heart. And that is the word of faith which we preach. People ask what denomination I am. And I say, well, I'm, we really don't have a denomination, but if I would be anything, I guess I'm word of faith. And they say, well, word of faith? You know, there's a lot of goofy word of faith preachers out there. You know, Well, there's a lot of goofy Presbyterians and Baptists and Catholics and everything. I mean, there's just, there's just goofy people out in the world. But here's the thing. The only thing that I can find in the New Testament where any preacher claimed to a phrase where they represented themselves, Paul said in this verse, the word of faith that we preach. So I preach what Paul preached. So if, pre, if, if Paul said it was the word of faith that he and Timothy and all of his contemporaries were preaching, if they were preaching the word of faith, I'm preaching what they're preaching, so I must be word of faith. And somebody says, well, there's goofy word of faith people. I'm not them. I'm me, okay? All right. Okay. So, in conclusion, here's what we do. Start your day with a positive confession in the Word. Just find something. It doesn't have to be anything earth-shattering. Just find something positive each day. You can start your day. This is the day the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know? What, what does that mean? Well, it's the day that the Lord hath made, and... I will rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> Hello, McFly. What? Do you need an interpretation for that? Here's the interpretation of that word. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Well, you know, we're not the doom and gloom people. The Scripture says, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. But my trial's different. No, it's not. Quit it. Snap out of it. Your trial is not different. Your trial's the same trial everybody's been going through for 2,000 years. The church is just... <laughs> this would get me in trouble, but I don't care. Don't think you're somebody special. 
I mean, you're special to God. And God loves you more than... No, He doesn't. He loves us all the same. He doesn't show partiality. Okay. What was the first thing I said? Start your day with a positive confession. If you don't know how to do that, see what God says in the Bible and just repeat it. Find something God says and repeat it. And then, as the day goes along, don't change from it. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, keep both hands on the wheel and say, mm, this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Somebody slaps you upside the head, that happens. Boom, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. And remember back a couple of hours ago when I said, this is not gonna, I'm not going to keep you long today. I apologize for lying. <laughs> but it's just so good. All these scriptures are so good. You, we need them. We need them. And, and we're all going through trials in our lives. I mean, if you're not going through a trial in your life, then... Wow. <laughs> Everybody I know is going through something. But I'm going to consider it all joy when I encounter various trials knowing that the testing of my faith I'm not being tested, my faith is being tested and I'm fighting the good fight of faith and I have been given authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by no thing nothing shall by any means harm me let's stand up hallelujah Father in the name of Jesus we give honor today to you and Father, we, we say this, put a guard on our mouth. In the name of Jesus, amen.